Covering publications. All right? It's going to be plenty of fun. Cold in here? All right, so first thing we're going to talk about is the uh, Code of Federal Regulations. We are Title 14, Aeronautics and Space. We also have a couple under Title 49, Transportation. All right? We're going to discuss the AIM. Advisory circulars, notice to airmen, and the chart supplement itself. Okay? So, Title 14, who's actually looked at the regs? Okay. What's the definition of an airplane? I'm sorry? Like air readiness and being like loud. Any manned object that goes up in the air and isn't a balloon? Probably includes that man. No. I'm throwing stuff at the wall to see if it's six at this point. I didn't read it. Where would you look? Part one. Everybody, who has their far aim on them? Digital. Probably everybody has at least something. Can you read me the definition of an airplane out of the race? <laughs> you guys are all in, you go to, when you're flying them, you at least know what it is, right? Is it something to do with engine driven, heavier than air aircraft, supported in flight by the dynamic reaction of air against its wings? Fixed yeah, wings. It's on the tip of my That's, why is it described that way? Well, engine driven. It's a big one, right? It's heavier than air. Do we have lighter than air aircraft? Balloons, right? Balloons and flips. What about you know, like a motor, an electric motor that's still counted as an engine by that definition? Engine driven. It's motor driven. Well, it's an electric motor, so it's still driven. Okay. Okay. Um, gliders are supported in flight by the dynamic reaction of air against wings. They're heavier than air, which is not engine driven. So it's very specific in its description. All right. So part one is going to give you the definitions. We ran into, I pointed this out in the uh, POH2, didn't I? Under chapter one, there was that area that had the definition. So if you ever have a question about something, what the word means, Go and find the definition of it. Any regulate any aviation publication that the FAA gives you is going to have some form of definition for you. So you know what the word means. Okay? All right. Certification procedures, that's part 21. Uh, that's not really a big deal for you guys. Uh, not yet. It can play a part more down the road in the, in the commercial side because What's required for certification is in Part 21. So that's where they get that information from. Part 43, maintenance, preventative maintenance, alterations. Does anyone remember us discussing Part 23? Uh, I'm sorry, 43, any point. What was it we talked about? So it wasn't part of the study. Now, I was, I was required for flight is the airworthiness certificate itself. What did it say? It said the maintenance, preventative maintenance and alterations had to be done in accordance with parts uh, 21, 43, and 91, right? Well, there's 43 right there. And it also talks about maintenance, preventative maintenance, alterations. Who can do preventative maintenance? Can they? Regs state that the a certificated pilot can do that. You have a private 
a wreck or support pilot. There's a laundry list of things that we as pilots can do uh, as preventative maintenance on aircraft. We can sew fabric on the wings. We can do change out seatbelts. We can change out. Uh, we do oil changes. We can change tires. We change brakes. There's a lot of things we can do, and it's all outlined in Part 43. All right, that's one you're going to have to know. Part 61. Why is Part 61 important? Pilot training. How do you get your certificate? Part 61 is how you get it. Part 91 is how you lose it. <laughs> All right. And we're going to get into the ranks a little bit more here in a second. Uh, Title 49 transportation. Part 83 or 830, that's notifying the NTSB of any accidents or incidents. That outlines what you have to do, the time frame, and when. If it's anything having to do with flight controls, it is required that you report that to the NTSB. Power plant failure, I report that. All right. And then part 155, dealing with flight schools, that is for TSA, transportation, security. You have to prove that you are a U.S. citizen. Well, 1552, or 1552 is the one that tells flight schools that this is the stuff you have to have for each student. You have to have the endorsement in your logbook before you can fly to that flight school. Okay. So let's jump into the range real fast. We've gone, we've looked at ecfr.gov before. Here is all the different titles, all the way down through 50. For the Code of Federal Regulations, U.S. government's codes. All right, we are, like I said, we're Title 14, Aeronautics and Space. All right. Part one, definitions and abbreviations. Okay, it's important. Again, with the airplane, you have to know. If the DP asks you what, what's the definition of an airplane? Why isn't it, you know, it, if you go in there, you don't even know what the definition is, is of what you're trying to get a certificate for. I'm not you know, it's kind of looks bad, right? What's the definition of an airplane? Uh, has wings. Okay, so look in here. There's other things. There's lots of information in here. Class, what is class? You guys are going to run to this category, class, and type. You have it for your pilot certificate and for your aircraft certificate. All right. Does anybody know what the different categories are for aircraft? Letters in there? A normal. Utility. No back. Transport. Um, Computer. Okay. What about for pilots? What kind of categories are there for pilots? I'm sorry? Right. Oh. Sport. Oh. Airplane. Rotorcraft. Lighter than air. Lighter. Okay. What about type or uh, class for aircraft? Once again, now you're getting into aircraft or airplane, aircraft, lighter than air. Okay, it's weird how it all works out. If you look in the POH, it actually will tell you what category aircraft your weights fall to a certain category aircraft for pilot for Cessna 172. You're either in the normal or the utility category. Okay, it's what the it's what the aircraft is being used for. There's a lot of different aircraft. You can't just say it's well, your single engine, well, because a glider is an aircraft, it doesn't have an engine. A balloon is an aircraft, doesn't have an engine. But it's in the normal category. Is it just what's it being used for? Okay. Um, for us, it breaks down into um, what aircraft are we flying? And then our category, our classes are multi engine, single engine, land or sea. Okay, that's how that breaks down. And then type is the same for everybody. This stuff is broken down in the, I'm um, oh, sorry, here. Classes for pilots. 
or, I'm sorry, class of aircraft and class of pilots. Okay, it's all broken down inside in the definitions and abbreviations. What are some of the? Let's go to 43. Can you tell me what some of the preventative maintenance you guys can, you can do once you have your private pilot certificate? Appendix Alpha. So it's not major alterations, okay? It's where reading the reg is really important. We're talking about preventative maintenance. Yeah, last to shop absorber, absorber cord on landing gear. Servicing landing gear shock struts by adding oil, air, or both. Who knows how to service struts? Right. <laughs> I don't. I've never done it. Servicing landing gear. Uh, let's see here. Landing gear wheel bearings, such as cleaning and greasing, replacing defective wiring. Who's ever done wiring? All right. Who knows how to do cotter bits? Lubricating, not requiring disassembly of other remove or other than removal of non-structural items such as cover plates and stuff. Uh, simple fabric patches. Hydraulic fluid. Uh, yeah, I mean, this isn't all of it. Troubleshooting repair, broken circuits and landing gear light wiring circuits. Placing seats and or seat parts with placement parts approved. Placing seat belts. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Well, and this is all if you have a pilot certificate, not a not the student pilot certificate, but private, a rec, a sport, or anything else. Placing prefabricated fuel lines. There you go. Cleaning of balloon burner pilot and main nozzles in accordance with the balloon manufacturer's instructions. <laughs> Who knows what a ch magnetic chip detector is? You can remove, check, and replace it. Who determines if you should or shouldn't do this? Uh, you do. You do. <laughs> yeah. If you're operating an airplane, should you be able to go out there and add oil to the engine if you fly that airplane? Yeah. Should you be able to change the oil? Maybe, maybe not. It's your airplane, I would hope so. I would not want to pay somebody to do that. Yeah. But there's a lot. You don't you don't have to be an AMP for this. It's just a pilot certificate. This I was gonna say that like when airplane ownership comes around, pretty much that's an annual, like all of this crap. You can save yourself a ton of money if you do this. Now you still have to have an IA to sign off your annual, but you can do a lot of the work yourself and many IAs will be willing to cut a lot of money off if you do it yourself, do your or just uh, of course, you don't need to use gonna hook you up. <laughs> and then have the IA do it. Mm -hmm. But I know the AP can't sign it off. They can help you maintain it, then the IA can. Anyway, all right. So this is just stuff for you guys to know. Okay, the DP is going to all know that you have an idea of what preventative maintenance you can do, and at least know where to look. Okay, that's Appendix Alpha in Part Forty Three. That's where you look for the preventative maintenance, okay? So know where to go. And that's really ultimately the, today's class, but I want you to get out of this is where to go. I don't expect you to know this information yet. We're just introducing you to the regs, okay? Where to look. So 43, that's maintenance, preventative maintenance, and alterations. You can do preventative maintenance once you have your certificate. If you have a question about what something means, go to the definitions in session one, all right? We're going to talk about 61 now, part 61. Certification, all right? It's broken down pretty nicely. I mean, there's a lot more to it. Applicability and definitions. Guess what? Here we go. Gives you, this is really important. Okay? You will have plenty of conversations with people about, well, what constitutes cross-country time? 
distances. Cross country time is important. If you're going up for your ATP, you have to have 500 hours of cross country time. So what counts as cross country time? What does it say? No leg shorter than 15 miles, total trip over 150 miles, multiple stops along the way. I can't do that. So you're just having to have an intent to land a different report. What's it say? All right. Means. Except plus, just like twice. What's that? Just zoom in a little bit. Ah, I guess so. This is on a web page. I just zoom in a web page. Control plus. Or control. Does that have to be a little more? Could you say it a little bit more tricky than Sarka? Maybe. Can I be more sarcastic? I can get very sarcastic. Do that. I agree with that. Oh, that's so great. We're all here to learn. Okay. Hey. Sometimes a little intensity is all it takes. All right, so what is it? What is cross-country time? What does it constitute? We had somebody say, you have to make an attempt to land. Is that what it says? Wheels have to touch. What do you mean? Does it say wheels have to touch? I think so. Landing at a point other than the point of departure. Yeah, so you gotta land. Touch and go. Yep. Touch and go is a landing. It's a landing. Okay. Well, I also under part 61, I recently learned this the hard way, that the requirement for cross-country Final cross country is more than 100 nautical miles total with one leg of 50 nautical miles or more. Uh, with landings at three spots, full stop landing. That is specific to a, a certificate. That right, you're that's why we have the 61. After you get past that, if you were working towards a rating, no matter what rating it is, you have for it to count, it has to be greater than 50 nautical miles. Has to be. If you're working on your private instrument, commercial, ATP, any cross country time, it has to be greater than 25 nautical miles. 20, I'm sorry, 50. You have the 25 down here. Okay. I did, I did a this touch and go at, at, at one of the three spots uh, so that cross country didn't count as my final. Right. I had, it was, had to be a full stop because it was windy. At, it's like, ah, no, do that. Over. And they, the spray specify what you have to do. This is just in general for it to count towards cross country time. Okay? What you're talking about is, and we're going to get to that here in a second, okay? All right. Exercise privilege is kind of important. This one here. This reg is very important to us, all right? So, Telling you what you have to do. Or you know, all the requirements for it. Well, actually, no, this is not what I'm looking for. It's fine. Here we are. Okay. Here are what I was talking about category ratings for us as pilots, okay? Because it's under part 61. So here's all your different categories. Okay, and then you get down to classes. All right, why does it category and class matter to us? Because they're different. Okay, but what is this as a pilot? Where does this matter? Okay, how about your what do you have to do in order to stay current? What are your currency requirements? Make so many custom landings in. Type. Oh, we have type, category, and class. So I hold an airplane single engine land and an airplane multi engine land certificate. If I go do three touch and goes during the day in my Cessna, can I go fly a Seneca with passengers? No, it's not the same category and class. It's still an airplane category. The classes are different, okay? Specified in the regs. This is the reg it goes to. Is number is uh, 61.5. Okay. 
So when you have a question about what kind of category of class you have on your certificate, this is where you look. Okay. All right. Let's get down to actually student stuff. It's going to matter most to you guys. All right. Do you guys want to know what you need to do solo? Solo is like, that's the first goal as a student pilot. All right. Well, right here. 187. Do you guys know how your training works? Like what how it's broken down? Any ideas? No. You have three stages at a 141. And usually this is how it works out anyways, no matter where you go. The first stage, what are you trying to do? After graduate school? Yeah, that's that's not part of your flight training. Become more familiar. What's that? Oh, what's your goal? Stage one. What are you ultimately trying to do to complete stage one? Solo. Solo. You want to solo that airplane. You're going to go up there without your instructor. You're going to fly that plane in the pattern by yourself on the radios. Do all of that alone. It's the first time you get to log pilot and command time. How much of your training do you think it takes up trying to solo? First third. So bulk of it. You're learning to fly an airplane by yourself. Everything after that's downhill. You're almost done at that point. Once you solo, you're almost done. It's a huge part of your training. Everyone gets all hung up on solo. Oh, I got to solo. I didn't solo at 10 hours. You shouldn't solo at 10 hours. If you solo at 10 hours, you're not safe. You don't know what you're doing yet. I guarantee it. And if you do, awesome. You're a really quick learner. But doubtful. You probably have no idea what to do other days. You haven't had enough flights to experience anything yet. I guarantee you've only done traffic pattern. And on one runway with no issues, how are you ready to go by yourself and encounter something that you've never done? So yeah, once you solo, that's the bulk of it. All right. And to help you get to that point, you need to know what you need to focus on, don't you? This tells you what to study, what you need, you're going to be, you have to know in order to go. Okay. Knowledge. We have to give you a written test before you can go fly solo. Mm -hmm. Now, the test is not bad. It's graded to 100. It's open book, and we you sit down with your instructor, we grade it together to 100%. We go over everything. Make sure you know what it is. All it is is on the airspace you're flying in, the aircraft you're flying in, and um, just general stuff like the emergency procedures. What do you do if you lose calm in the pattern, like lost calm procedures? What do you do? Light gun signals, things like that. Okay, Performance, you do weight and balance for your airplane. No, it's not any. It's not this really difficult test. It's not like you're going to do an FAA written. It is all things you should know from your training already. Be able to identify airspace on a chart that you're flying. Okay. What are the cloud clearances? What weather? What weather should you avoid? Things like that. It's very simple. This tells us. I mean, we are required to administer this test, and it stays in your training records in some form or fashion. Okay. After that, here's your flight training. Prior to conducting so flight, student pilot must have received a lot of flight training from for the maneuvers and procedures of this section that are appropriate to make and model of the aircraft flown, and demonstrated satisfactory proficiency and safety as judged by an authorized flight instructor, a CFI that is authorized to fly in that airplane, on the maneuvers and procedures required by this section in the make and model of aircraft or similar make and model. So. If you fly with me down here in a Cessna 172S and then you decide you want to go fly with me down at Angel in a 172P, is that not similar make and model? Yeah. I just have to make sure that you know the differences. These are fuel injected, those are carbureted, there's carb heat. 180 horsepower versus 160 horsepower. These are heavier, those are lighter. Okay? That's all taking, you don't have to take multiple tests. Okay? All right. The maneuvers you have to do. All right, you ready? Proper flight preparation procedures, including pre-flight planning, preparation, power plant operation, and aircraft systems. You've got to understand your systems. Why do you have to know your aircraft systems? Find out something good wrong. How do you have to troubleshoot it if you don't know how it works? How can you fix it in the air or address the issue if you have no understanding whatsoever of that system? <laughs> your autopilot turns on automatically. What do you do? How? Circuit breaker. Okay. Prior to that, though, what can you do? You have the disconnect switch on the yoke. 
that doesn't work, you can hit the off switch on the autopilot itself. If that doesn't work, oh right. How do I know this? I encountered that on my solo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. Most students are going to think to disconnect it first, which is good. That's what you want, but you have to know how to troubleshoot the problem. Because guess what? When you come back to me and want to say, well, did you try this? Did you try that? You can help make this out a lot. You can tell them, well, these are all the steps I took, and it didn't work. Well, then I did this. Now they have an idea of where to go. And they troubleshoot, right? The more you knowledge the maintainer has, the better they can fix it and faster. Pilots are worthless. They give in. But not pilots who know what they're doing. So, all right. Taxi and surface ops, including run ups. Holy crap, you guys have to know how to taxi, do run ups, and move about the surface on an airport. Weird, huh? <laughs> Straight level flight. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. Prior to that, takeoffs and landings, all right? Including normal and crosswind. Oh my gosh. Is it possible you might have to take off on a, your initial solo and have a slight crosswind? Do you need to know how to handle that? Okay. <laughs> Straight level flight, turns in both directions, climbs and climbing turns, airport traffic pattern, including entry and departure procedures, collision avoidance, wind shear avoidance, and weight turbulence avoidance, descents with and without turns using high and low drag configurations. What does that mean? Flaps or no flaps, or slips, but that comes in later. Flight at various airspeeds from cruise to slow flight. What is the definition of slow flight? Does anybody know? Any airspeed less than cruise. All right. Stall entry from various flight attitudes and power combinations with recovery initiated at the first indication of the stall and recovery from a full stall. You have to do both, imminent and full. Emergency procedures and equipment malfunctions, ground reference maneuvers, approaches to a landing area with a simulated engine malfunction, slips to a landing. And go arounds. So, what's missing on there as far as your flight training goes? There's only one thing I can think of that they had not mentioned. Does anybody know what it is? Yeah, Ground is. school. Bingo. Well, they didn't talk about communications, but it did say movement, right? Traffic pattern ops. We have a tower that's included in that. So, what is it that you're not being taught prior to solo that you're going to do later on? As far as learning how to fly an airplane. You have to, in order to be able to solo, you have to demonstrate you can do all these things safely on your own. There's no input from an instructor. You are learning to fly an airplane. That everything else after this is you're going to go on cross countries. You are just checking off hours and time blocks. Fine tuning. That's all it is. You get introduced to two different landings and steep turns. And that's it. It's the new stuff that just. Uh, short and soft landings and steep turns after your solo. Other than that, then you're getting ready for check ride. You knock out the cross country phase. So your solo phase is first, cross country phase, and the whole goal of your cross country phase is to do solo cross countries. And then after that, check ride. That's it. Once you get that solo done, it is boom, boom, you're done, out of here. Okay? It's telling you everything you need to know, everything you need to study. Big one. Study this. Start studying systems now. There's no reason not to know the aircraft you're going to be flying now. Okay? Power plant operations. How does an engine work? Why does leaning matter? What do you do if you are flying around and you encounter engine roughness? What should you do? The engine. Not fly at rich. You off the engine. If you're in cruise, you're in the engine. Okay, this is part of engine operations. This is what the book will tell you to do. So start studying that stuff now, okay? Can you do what can you do as far as taxi and surface ops? What can you do to learn about this stuff now? Anything? What's it on the radio? What's important about surface operations? Runway signs and lines. Yeah, runway signs and markings. Learn those. Know what you're looking for prior to getting an airplane and going out there. The sooner you can get all this stuff knowledge-wise learned, like how do you correct for a crosswind? Does anybody know? 
What is it? What? Crafts for a cross? Right. Crafts. And? How? Explain a rudder and aileron crossman correction. And we do not want to land craft. That is, you'll sideload the landing gear. It's not good. Well, coming in, you have to dip the wing to the crosswind. So you turn into the wind. And then what's the rudder for? Well, to keep you off course. It's alignment. You don't want to be. What is it? Alignment. With? Center line. Center line. Okay. The rudder keeps you aligned with the center line. The nose points at the run at the center of the runway at all times. The ailerons are going to keep you left or right of the center line. It's going to keep you over it. That's what the ailerons are for. Are you going to be cross controlled? Are you going to have say you have a wing coming at you from the left? Are you going to have left aileron left wing down, right rudder in? You're going to be cross controlled. That's the proper way. You're going to come down. Which wheel should touch first? Upwind or downwind wheel? Upwind wheel, and then downwind, and then nose. It should be boom, boom, boom. That is proper crosswind. It's right here. Guess where this is talked about? The airplane flying handbook. Maybe read the airplane flying handbook before you start flying. Okay? Talks about straight level turns, talks about climbs and descents. All this stuff is talked about in an FAA handbook somewhere. You've got to know it prior to solo. Might as well start learning now because the more knowledge you have prior, the faster the flying is going to go, the cheaper it's going to be. You'll be that 35 hour student that crushes it and is out of there and on instrument. So you can wait for six months to a year. That was a joke. <laughs> kind of. Sorry. Because it's true. <laughs> All right. Questions on this? How important is part 61 to you? How about we look at. So that was. Solar requirements for students. Look at this. Solo cross country requirements. It tells you what you have to do in order to be able to solo, to go on a solo cross country. Okay. Now, the really important ones. So you'll see here 80s, 80s through 90s, right? It's all student pilots. 100 and 2 through 17. Oh, kind of. 13. Our R is going to be private. So once you've soloed, and once you've done your solo cross country, what are we worried about? Well, applicability. Do you, are you qualified? Can you do it? Eligibility requirements. What are what some of the eligibility requirements for your uh, to become a private pilot? Medical. Seventeen to be a private pilot. Sixteen to solo. You have to be 17 to get a pilot certificate. 16 in physical library. Board. Be able to read, speak, write, and understand the English language. Okay, that is a requirement. And that's a requirement for every country. Okay. You have to receive a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor who trained you. And here's all the things that that individual had to train you on. You have to meet the aeronautical experience requirements under this part. Well, that comes down later, okay? You have to hold a U.S. pilot student pilot certificate, a sport pilot certificate, or a rec pilot certificate, okay? How many of you have a student pilot certificate? By the time you start flight training, you all will raise your hand. <laughs> it's not hard to get. You just have to have an instructor sign off on it. You have to go on IACRA, and that which is the FAA's database for it, and apply for it, and go get it pretty quickly. Okay. All right. So, aeronautical knowledge. Everything you need to know, right here. Oh, look. Applicable rates. Accident reporting requirements for the NTSB. What was the reg on that one? 49 part 830. Yeah, you already know it. That's ready to go right now, right? After proportions of the aim. 
which what's one portion of the aim that we've already talked about? Well, there's a bunch of them. Somebody throw one out there that we talked about that you remember. Yeah, traffic pattern. What else? Airspace. Airspace is in there. Yeah. What else? I'm saying. What was that? It? Medical, right? Fitness for flight. These are all applicable to us as pilots, as private pilots. All right. Charts for VFR nav using pilotage, dead reckoning, and navigation systems. Radio communication procedures. Recognition of critical weather situations from the ground and in flight. Wind shear avoidance. And procurement of aeronautical weather reports and forecasts. Safe and efficient operation of aircraft. Collision avoidance. How do we avoid collision? So that's way to, that's way to avoid collision. Don't see and avoid. See and avoid. How much of our time should be spent outside the airplane and how much is spent inside the airplane? 90-10. 90-10. That's what the FAA says. 90% outside, 10% inside. It's straight out of the airplane fly handbook. Effects of density altitude on takeoff and climb performance. <laughs> Weight and balance computations. All of this stuff you're going to do on a regular basis, though, for the most part. Either scanning, you're going to be evaluated on scanning. What are they going to make sure? That when you're out there, you're not the DP and, and we as instructors can tell when you're looking inside versus outside. It's very obvious. So you know what I look for? Your eyelashes. <laughs> down, up, down, up. It's pretty obvious, even if you're wearing sunglasses. I know where you're looking. <laughs> I can also tell when the airplane's doing this, or we can't maintain a heading, and the altitude's all over the place, or something is going wrong because looking inside at one indicator when everything else is going to hell outside of it. <laughs> so that's also another indicator that you're not outside. All right. Uh, principles of aerodynamics, power plants, and aircraft systems. Does that sound familiar? Where's all this information at? Pilot Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. You guys want a guidepost on how to get your private? All right here in the regs. Everything you need to know is here in the regs. Everything. Stall awareness, spin entry, spin, spin recovery techniques, where's that at? Airplane flying handbook. Aeronautical decision making and judgment, where's that at? Pilot handbook, aeronautical knowledge, chapter two. Risk management. Actually, it's aeronautical decision making. Risk management's in there. Pre flight actions. So, how to obtain information on runway lengths at airports? How do you find information on runway lengths at airports of intended use? Where do you guys look? The supplement. You guys already know where to go. Okay, you're starting to, the pieces are there. They're starting to come together. Okay, we, I know this has been a kind of a, there's a lot of information really, really fast in here, but information start, it's there. Got, we went through a lot of this stuff. <coughs> now you have to just pick up the pieces of what you found and start putting the puzzle together, okay? All right, so this is your aeronautical knowledge, all right? Well, flight proficiency is everything you're going to have to demonstrate, okay? So, remember what I told you about 61.5, how it being important? Airplane category, single engine class. That category class, you're not going to get away from it as far as your certificate goes, okay? The pilot size you did remember is the aircraft one, the normal category, utility category. That kind of stuff is going to be a little bit more challenging because it doesn't, they don't correlate to each other, okay? Pre flight prep, pre flight procedures, airport and seaplane base operations, takeoffs, landing, go around, performance maneuvers, ground reference maneuvers, navigation, slow flight installs, starting to seem familiar been talked about previously hasn't it now you're gonna to have to demonstrate for your private you can do all this stuff you had to demonstrate safety for your pre-solo yes we have to demonstrate for your private safety do you have to be an expert going up for your private pilot certificate no no what do you have to demonstrate safe you're a safe pilot that understands the general rules okay competency all right, so this is it right here. 
That's it. That you're going to be evaluating your flight proficiency that you have to demonstrate. That's all of it right there. Okay? Because you just got to follow the single class rating. Come down here, there's multi engine. That's not us. Not yet. Okay? All right. Now we we're talking about cross countries before. Guess what? Aeronautical experience. This is going to break down every all the experience you have to have in order to go up. Okay. Now this is going to be part. This is part 61, not 141. It's a little bit different on the 141 side. You guys only have to have 35 hours here as a part 141 school. Okay. Single engine except as provided paragraph uh, kilo of a session. A person who applies for a private pilot. Single airplane or category, airplane category, single engine. I must have logged at least 40 hours. Okay, this is the rule I had to run. Or no, I was 41. That's right. 40 hours for everyone else is not in a part 141 program. The part 61 side. Okay, you guys get that five hour bonus. Three hours of cross country flight training. In so you have to fly with an instructor for three hours of cross country. All right, and it breaks it down. <sighs> You have to do three hours of night training, one cross country. It has to be over 100 miles. Okay. Well, if you're going, it only has to have one stop. So if it has to be greater than 100 miles, what's the other requirement for it? The total distance has to be over 100 miles. That means at least one of your legs has to be greater than 50. Guess what? How far tall keeping this from here? It's <laughs> <laughs> like 51, 52 miles from here. As the crow flies. Straight, Straight line distance. distance. How far is Kenai? <laughs> 51, 52 miles. So those are cross countries of choice. Okay. You also have to do 10 takeoffs and 10 landings to a full stop. Where? In the traffic pattern. So you can't make it straight in and landing and count that. On your cross country, Ooh, has to be in pattern. Okay. Three hours of training. Yeah, this is a good one. Three hours of flight training in a single engine airplane on the control. Is that the one? Maneuvering. Yeah, maneuvering an airplane solely by reference to instruments. You guys have to go into the foggles and do three hours of hood time flying the airplane in simulated instrument conditions. You're out in the airplane in the air with a view limiting device on, and all you have are your instruments. You cannot see outside. You have to fly for three hours. Now, that's obviously broken up throughout your training, but you have to demonstrate instrument, some instrument proficiency. Why? Why do we have to do instrument training? Bad stuff happens. What do you do if it happens? What is it? What are you supposed to do if you get into IMC? Yeah. Out. What are you trying? Preferably, if you know you're not going to run into terrain. Sometimes you might need to climb or climbing turn. Okay. So but that is why we do this. You also have to practice unusual attitudes because what's more likely what's going to happen. You will get disoriented and you will end up nose high in a turn or nose low in a turn and know what to do. Okay. The procedures for unusual attitudes are in the airplane flying handbook. Okay. So you have to have three hours of flight training with an authorized instructor 60 days prior or two calendar months, 60 days prior to your check ride. You have to have 10 hours of solo flight time. So of the 40 or of the 35, you have to have 10 hours of solo. So you're only doing 25 hours with an instructor here. It's not much. Okay. Five of it has to be cross country. So what I usually do is with my students, we'll knock out, well, here it's different. We have to, we have a structured program we follow. But at Down at Angel, what I usually do is that we will get them soloed. Like, yay, congrats, you're done. Now let's do cross country. Cross country done now, cross country solo. Knock out those really fast. And then we get into the maneuvers, and the solo time that's left over, you got to practice there, and you practice maneuvers on your own. The whole purpose of doing the solos 
at that point is to gain confidence in your own skills. <coughs> the ability to recognize and recover things without the instructor there telling you check altitude, check altitude, check altitude, heading, 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 right rudder, right rudder, right rudder. Okay? Right. So yeah, you're gonna hear that one. Right rudder, right rudder, right rudder. All right. Here is the solo cross country flight of 150 miles, total distance with full stop landings at three points and one segment of flight consisting of a straight line distance of more than 50 nautical miles between the takeoffs and landing locations. <laughs> and three takeoffs and landings to a full stop of length, each landing involving a flight in the traffic pattern at an airport with an operating control tower. Okay, so that is everything you have to do. Those cross-country flights that you're going to do on your own, you're going to do it in the start. So I was reading in the 61-110 about the night flying thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is an exception here. Yeah, so is that saying that in the summertime if you do it and you don't have you have a restriction on your certificate until so night? You it. So you just go to an examiner and show up. I I have to read it. I've not run into it yet. I don't know exactly how it all works out. I haven't done it yet. Right now, I'm scrambling to try to get as many night flights done as possible on anybody that might come up this summer on my trip list. Yeah. So I've got a night flight tonight, which might not happen with the weather. It's very difficult. What? <laughs> it's rough, I know. I know. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It's like the weather is crapping out all the time. That's more Actually, there's been a couple of days. There's been a couple of days that it's been the same. It's been like, oh, that's nice, and then it just like. Weather's been pretty great lately. I think. Sunday it's been pretty good yesterday. We had some. We've had some very weird winds though. I don't know. We were talking about it today with some of the other instructors. We're not sure if it was just winds off the mountain or if it's wind turbulence from the airport because <laughs> everybody keeps flying. All the big boys are flying over top of us constantly. Right I now. I can't tell you they're going Kenai. Over the mountains, over the glacier, over the girt wood, totally smooth. But right. yeah, it, it must be the weight turbulence from them then, because it was the weirdest winds ever. It's out of the practice area, it's reporting five knots at 3,000 feet, and four knots at 6,000 feet the other day. Beautiful out there, and you come in, the pattern it is just crap. Wind shear everywhere, like you're going down, you're in the pattern, you bump around the whole time. On final, my student, we had tailwind, then we had headwind, then we had tailwind, then we had headwind, then we had tailwind. It's like, and you look at the sock, and the sock's dead. Like, I don't know what's going on. Here. <laughs> yeah, my student was getting really frustrated yesterday. I mean, today, coming back in, we were doing 105, and from the farm fields on the northwest side of the practice area to Sleeper Strip, which is a good 20 miles, I was hands-free the whole time. We were trimmed out 2,400 feet the whole time, right on heading. There was no wind. It was beautiful. Like literally, my feet, I had them resting on the rudders, but my hands were on my lap. Power was set. My student had his hands on the bottom, bottom of the rudder pedals. He wasn't doing anything either. This was brand new. This is fourth flight today. And we were flying back like that. It was that nice out. So with all that wake turbulence, is that worth a phone call to APC? Hey, can you try to route them differently? Like that. Not worth it. They're, they're not going to do anything. I don't know. They can't do anything. They have to do it that way right now with the winds. Oh. Right. The winds are favoring seven. They, we have notams constantly, which we'll get to in a sec, talking about notams. But yeah, that's. They're taking off seven. That's the way they have to take off right now with the weather. The north south downwind is all thrown up. They're working on it for the rest yeah. of the summer. Yeah. So all the traffic comes east points. Oh, so I, I didn't realize it was thrown mm -hmm. up. Yep. But they've been doing that for a while now. And it, I mean, it's fine. They did we it last need, summer, and this is the last, this, this year, gotcha. the second and last year. And runway is, runway's absolutely, they closed down 257 the other day on us because they were cleaning it. We were doing touch and goes on bus 1634, and I'll tell you what, for a brand new student that's never flown on that one before, <laughs> it's rough on them, you guys, because it's, that run was short. And there's terrain changes, and the winds are really weird off of it. Coming in on the three four side, on glide slope, you're barely missing the trees. It's crazy. Like, we are coming in, and like, oh, we are really close. They need clipping. the same thing on the 2.5. No, not even close. 2.5, no. you have plenty of clearance. 
on wide slope. Oh. It's not over on three, four side. You're, we're probably within 20 feet. <laughs> top of the trees on three, four side. Yeah, about almost 100 feet on two, five. Oh. All right. Questions on what you're going to have to know. All right. If you notice, there becomes a trend here. 100. Point two, which is an oddity. 103, 105, 107, 109, 121, 123, 125, 127. What's this one? 151, 153, 155. You see we have a trend going here. 181, 183, 185, 187, 189. Which is, and it's all the same stuff. Proficiency, all, the, all broken down the same way, okay? Makes it easy down the road. But the 100s, that's us. Seven or nine is the big one. Okay. Oh, we're gonna look at the night flight exception. Okay. So yeah, all you have to do at that point is it's not with the DPU. Uh, you just do. It. Yeah. Yeah. You just present it to an examiner. Yeah, you can go to the physician and get it done. Or you just have Ray Hodges do it or whoever, and then you're good. And then you'll get a new certificate that removes that limitation. So, cool. All right. Now the big one. So 61 is how you get it, okay? 91 is how you lose why, it. Why would you get, why would you get, why would you get night flight? Well, we're coming into the summertime. Right, right. But what is the definition of night for takeoffs and landings? Civil, it has to go by civil twilight. Civil twilight. Does anybody right? know yeah, the so time? It's, it's an like hour night. after sunset. Okay. No? That's for logging, logging night, land, or, uh, night flight. It's one hour after sunset. Civil twilight and one hour after sunset do not necessarily mesh. They can be totally different. I suppose it was just more of like, you're, yeah, I, I, I get it. If you're doing your flight training in summertime, you may not have the opportunity. Do you know what time civil, end of the evening civil twilight is right now? It's 10 10.40 or something like that. That was close. Yeah, it's late. And the longer we go, the less and less we'll have. We'll get to a point where you can't do it. You just don't have any nights. Use five minutes a day. And you have to have how many hours of it? Three. Three hours. You have to do a cross country and you have to do the traffic pattern. 10 takeoffs and landings to a full stop. Three and a half hours, let's go. Right, it takes an hour to get that done. So, um, yeah. And, it depends on the timing of your training. Like right now, all my students are good. I have some students down there that I'm, like I said, right now I'm scrambling. They've soloed, now we're knocking out the night stuff now. It's stage two for them, we're knocking it out. Get it done. Now they don't have to worry about it. So I already did the landings with one guy and doing the, I was gonna try to do the cross country tonight, see if that happens. I have another um, night flight um, on Thursday after I do the Sims with you guys. It, Leaves me right there at like 10 o'clock. Time to go. You know? So, as long as your instructor is paying attention to the time of year, you shouldn't have an issue with it up here. Because your flight training can take several months, depending on what happens with weather and aircraft availability. Okay? And that is all where would you look for that for night and currency requirements? It breaks it down in there too. But yeah. Second. All right. General operating flight rules. So this one's got a lot of this is an important side. The 61, all you're worried about is your certificate stuff, okay? The 91 is really important. So we've already talked a little bit. Here is a big one that we've talked about, right? Alcohol and drugs. Okay, dropping objects. Can you drop objects? 
Yeah. Okay. Back on flat. Tells you what you have to do to that Fulcrum. You can't you cannot endanger anybody on the ground. Careless reckless operations prohibit uh, prohibit uh, prohibition on interference with crew members. Uh there's your narcotics. Don't do that. <laughs> Flight rules. So this is just general here. Civil aircraft are worthiness. Uh, this one's kind of good. You this is on that market that uh cheat sheet I gave you guys for worthiness that is outlined there though, or your placard and stuff like that. All right. How about this one? You guys remember reading that one? What is your responsibility and authority? Yes, no, maybe. It was usually <laughs> true. The pilot in command is the is well, we'll just get to it. And they'll be all pretty much. Right? Directly responsible for and the final authority as to the operation. Okay. Now, talked about this before, right? A little bit. You can deviate from any rule of this speed in right? What are they? How about this part? Though? Where are they going to? Why are they going to request that? What are they looking for? See if they should change the rule. No. Punish. No. How are they going to determine that? Look at the regs. Is there a reg that might tell us that they're looking for here? Think about this. Uh -huh. Is this one safe? Read the blue part. Let me read it to me. Huge pilot in command shall, before beginning of flight, become familiar with all available information concerning that flight. That's what they want to know. Did you become familiar with all available information? So a lot of if it was something that happened that was out of your control, do you think they're gonna hold you responsible for it? No. no. If you took off with not enough fuel and you ran out of fuel and now you made an emergency landing in somebody's field. Think they're going to come after you for that? No, nope. probably. Okay, you took off with inoperable equipment that you knew about, probably, and they caused a problem. Probably going to come after you for it. Okay, so all available information. We talked about this before. That was pretty broad, isn't it? How do you know if you got all available information? <laughs> Just do your due diligence. Try to get as much information as possible. Cover your bases. Play that what if game. Well, what if this happened? What can I do to prevent that? Things like that. Okay. And then he goes on to tell you the at minimum things. So, all right. 91.3 and 91.103 are very important regulations. All right. You have right away rules, aircraft speeds, minimum safe altitudes, okay? All this stuff is very, very important. Airspace, all right? So, uh, let me go into minimum safe. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, we have talked about the minimum safe altitude before, I believe, right? 500 over 1,000 feet over congested area within a 2,000 radi foot radius. You guys remember to call that at all? Okay. Well, there you go. 91.119 is the minimum safe altitude. Okay. Down here, we talked about it a little bit before. VFR cruising altitudes. All right. What other ones in this 91.51 through 61 area have we talked about? How about this one? We haven't talked about that one really, have we? Fuel requirements? So let me look that one up real fast. Tell me what the fuel requirements are for the AFR flight. Enough to make it to your destination for 30 minutes during the day and 45 at night. There you go. 
Good. How about VFR flight plan information required? We've got the basic VFR weather minimum, special VFR weather minimum. All right. Cruising altitudes. So, regs you want to know, okay? Then we get down into the equipment. 205 is important for the uh, certification requirements, okay? But, so I want you guys to remember this. If you have an operative instrument or equipment, which way, reg do you go to? Ninety-one two thirteen. Okay. Supplemental oxygen. That's a fun one. Let's go to that real quick. What are the requirements on supplemental oxygen? Who knows? Without looking it up. <clears throat> Do you? Oh, yeah, I have a question for you guys. Who has worn oxygen on an airliner? Yeah, you, when you fly an airliner, you have to wear oxygen, right? No. You have a mask? Well, you guys, he said above an altitude of 12, or I don't know what he said. Have an altitude. Uh, I'm sorry? Well, you still have to have supplemental oxygen yeah. unit as a pressurized aircraft in case of depressurization. Past cabin altitude. It says in here that you have to use it after 30 minutes. Must be used. Cabin pressure altitudes. Oh. So, <clears throat> that's the important part, okay? When you're flying around in your 172 at 10,000 feet, what's your cabin pressure altitude? If you're flying in an airliner at 36,000 feet, what's your cabin pressure altitude? 8,000? 9,000. No. <laughs> yeah, it's the dream loader. Yeah, it's the dream loader. 6,000. Is it? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it could be anywhere between 8 and 10 for most airlines, 6,000 in Dreamliner. But the pro point is that cam pressure altitude is what matters. That's the thing you have to remember, okay? And it's this is the other word that's very important. Not at 12,500, it's above 12,500, okay? It's above 14,000, it's above 15,000, okay? And required minimum flight crew. Okay. What's the required minimum flight crew in a Cessna 172? One. All right. What if you're above 15,000 feet? Cam pressure out to 15,000 feet. What do you have to do then? You have it. What do you have to do for your passengers? Do they have to use it? They have to be provided. They don't have to use it. it just has to be provided. <laughs> No. It will no, be no, nice. <laughs> Provided. Doesn't say anything about use. Uses. Uses. No uses in this one. Okay? It might not be a quiet flight, depending on their hypoxic symptoms. Don't pass out. Manifest. Don't pass out. All right. So, but the point is, with, when you guys read the regs, okay, there's specific wording in there for a reason. There are very specific words you have to remember. For the minimum, the cruising altitudes, okay? For VFR cruising altitudes. If you're above 3,000 feet AGL, that's when those cruising altitudes come to play. The odds plus 500, the evens plus 500, okay? It's above 3,000 feet AGL. Above a cabin pressure altitude of 12,500 feet for greater than 30 minutes. Now, the one thing on here that the FA will get you on that's not really stated and not clear is it's more than 30 minutes of duration. That's combined, not down and back up, okay? It's combined. It doesn't say how long until you can go back up there again either. Like, you've been on the ground, you've landed, are you good to go immediately on a turnaround, like a 30-minute turnaround? It's not stated. That, that's up to a lawyer. So how can that be so vague? It's not tell in greater detail another reg? It's just vague so, there, and they're like, <laughs> Yeah, they will put out a letter describing uh, advising, and they have for that one saying that this is not the intent of it. Now, there isn't any direction that I know of discussing after landing. The way I understand it, the way the reg is written, that after landing, it starts all over. Reset. You reset your clock. Okay? So, but there is specific wording in each of the regs that you have to pay attention to. It will get you. Okay? Question? 
Right, any questions on the rates? I mean, that's not how else would uh, skydiving pilots. <laughs> well, how high do they go? Uh, 13,000 feet. Is the how long are they up there? Well, long enough to throughout the course the of a day, they're up there for hours. Yeah. But they always land. Up the fight. And they're back down, right? Yeah. And then they're up. That's, that's, that's right. what I'm saying. Like, that's, so each landing resets it. Basically resets it. As far as I, that's how I would read the brain. Yeah. Because they have to come back down, pick up the next load, and they're back up there. <laughs> So, I mean, honestly, though, how long are they above? Can't fresh out to 12,000 pounds. Depends on what kind of plane, how many dives yeah. they have. Right, I mean, it, they're so, up, they're out, and they're back down. And uh, how many do they do per day? Oh, probably two to three an hour. Yeah, they're fine, and they're probably not even hitting the 30 minutes, uh, even in that time. So, if you, but you it have, doesn't matter. If you have like a twin otter full of dudes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not just exiting in mass. Like but, they could be over the drop zone. Yeah, I got you. Well, either way though, again, I'm figuring that at after landing it resets. Yeah, that, that must be what they operate off of then. So. Okay. And back to that real quick though. <laughs> how how are they gonna know? How's like, the FAA? How about this? You're flying around, you get any clouds. Does ATC know you just got in clouds? No. Any cloud no. What are they going to know? If something happens to you, or if <laughs> an airliner is given a traffic call and they say we're being we're IMC right now, oh, you're <laughs> IMC. This traffic is a mile away from you. They must be IMC also. <laughs> They're not on a flight plan. That's how you get in trouble, or you get into an accident. That's how you get in trouble. So if you're hypoxic and you've been spending a lot of time up there and they look at the records and they see how your flight plan or your flight path on radar, oh, this person spent a significant amount of time above 12,500 feet without oxygen, they crash, they're hypoxic, pilot error. So that's when you get caused when something happens, not just randomly. So, okay? The reason we follow these regs though is because people have died doing it. Written in blood. All right. Questions on any of this so far? You guys loving the rays? Are they fun? So does the sandpaper what? Hmm? Sandpaper what? Sandpaper. I shouldn't have asked. All right. <laughs> so we have gone through this part. So I'll talk about the aim. And we have. Uh, <laughs> Seven minutes left. <laughs> so, uh, the rest of the stuff's pretty quick, okay? The regs are very important. I want you guys to understand the regs, where to look, okay? The aim, very important. That's why I broke this down real fast for you guys on the aim. Air navigation, some of this is important, not all of it, okay? Aeronautical lighting, some of this is important, not all of it. A lot of the aim is specific to instrument flying. There's a lot of general information though. Okay, so no airspace, very important. All right, air traffic control. We are not their priority. Even when we're on we have flight following with the mountain the practice area, we are not their priority. Okay. Their priority is the instrument traffic that they're dealing with. They will give us advisories though when they may are able. So still keep your eye on traffic, okay? <laughs> air traffic procedures, emergency procedures, safety of flight. This weather's in the safety of flight one. Okay, the categorical outlooks is in there, regardless of VFR, VFR, IMC, or I'm sorry, uh, IFR and low IFR. Medical facts for pilots, I am safe is in there, okay? Aeronautical charts, helicopter operations, don't care about that, okay? <laughs> All right, advisory circulars. This is gonna be one of those things the FAA puts out to help just to explain a regulation further, okay? You're gonna run into one when you get to your commercial. What is the definition of holding out? Holding out is advertising for yourself or having somebody else advertise for you. That is, if you have somebody advertising for you, that's not allowed, you're not a carrier, okay? You don't have a not operator certificate. So, the regulation does not make much sense on it. Those AC they put out makes it even worse. It's, it, it doesn't clarify anything. It makes it even more confusing. <laughs> but the ACs are supposed to try to make things more clear. Okay, They clarify things. We use it as flight instructors on endorsements. 
there's an AC for us on endorsements. And that's, I pull that up every time I endorse my student saw it. It is under 60 for airmen. If you go to the FAA's website and look up ACs or Google advisory circulars, it will give you the option. You can look by each different number. We're at 61 is the one that I use. 61-64 Fox trying to think is what it's on right now. If I'm not mistaken, I'd have to look. But it clarifies issues. There's icing ones in here. There's all sorts of stuff. Okay, so if you will find it down the road eventually when it will come into play. Initially for private, do they ever add it into into the bar? Like, eventually it might be changed, but mm, I don't know how often that happens. Yeah, so it's not like an in-between farce right. period. Um, 91213 has one, but it's not in operation anymore. They pulled it because ICAO has not, doesn't, it doesn't jive with something with ICAO. I can't remember what it is. But there's an issue with it, so it's no longer valid right now. But it, it's a nice a flow chart. Actually, that, that, that one dealing with 91213 is really super clear and makes the regulations <laughs> make more sense. <laughs> when you read through 91213, you're like, oh my God, there's a lot of information in here. And this one actually creates a, a flow chart. Right? If this, go here. If no, down. If yes, over here. If no, down. It's really nice and easy. It's very user-friendly. So that's why they pulled it out. No, it has to do with ICAO again. It's an international issue. Um, it will be cleared up eventually and probably reissued. Okay? Smart out. But anyway, so notice. Big one on these ones. You have four kinds of notice, okay? Notum Ds, FDC notums, pointer notums, and military notums. Notum Ds are issued for nav aids, public use airports, seaplane bases, heliport bases. Anytime you have a notum, if you hear a notum about something at an airport or um, like a nav aid's not working, say the um, DMA is out on or the Big Lake VOR, that is, you're going to have a notum for that. We have cranes around us, there's notums for the vicinity of the airport. If they're doing work on Quebec, there's a notum for that, okay? FTC notums are for regulatory issues, like charts. There's an issue with the chart. There's a notum, an FTC notum for that. Procedures, instrument procedures for sure. That's a big one to get FTC notums, okay? Aerospace, things like that, okay? These are the two primary ones you're going to deal with as pilots. Pointer notums, just like the name says, they point to another notum. So, hey, highlighting this notum. That's the whole point of a pointer note. Military notums are for military. We don't care. We don't get them. Okay. So these two are the ones you need to worry about ultimately. All right. The supplement itself. Everybody get your supplement out real quick. Okay. And this is the last slide. We're done after this. So the first one, section one, is the legend, okay? This is going to break down everything on uh, the airport page of your supplement. When you go flip to an airport and you see all this information on there, like, what does any of this mean? Legend breaks it down, okay? Section two is the directories. Look it up. Look at the, I want you to open up to section one. Look at the legend, Okay. And then look at the different airports. Like pick an airport and look at it. Start understanding what it's talking about, okay? There's a lot of information on there you need to know. It makes, again, that all available information concerning the flight, runway lengths, what features does that run airport have? Does it have fuel? Does it have maintenance services? Things like that. That information is in there. The navigate doesn't have. What are the frequencies? What are the frequencies to the FSS? Okay? You have the directory, any notices, associated data, procedures, emergency procedures, and diagrams. We have a lot of information on the back that deals with specific procedures for different airports around here. Paul Keena has this is a really good one. You have it says to avoid overflying downtown. Well, that's in there. Skagway has the, the departure procedure to get out of there because it's in a box can. We have several different departure procedures here at Merrill Field. We request a Nilla departure, a Shoreland departure, a Ship Creek departure, a City High departure, a Chester Creek departure, a um, Campbell departure. There's a bunch of them, different ones that we can 
uh, ask for. They all have their own procedures for it for each of the, for several different runways too. That's in there. Okay. So and then the airport diagrams for each of the airports that has one that provides you the runway length, the layout of the airport. Okay. So the chart supplement is a really really important tool. Get familiar with it. Know it. All right. Know what's the, what information is in there. The legend is the biggest one. Anytime you have a question about anything, look at the legend. Okay. Any questions on this so far? What we can, well, any questions on tonight's discussion? Okay. We have a couple weeks left. What I want you guys to do is think of some things you want to discuss, okay? I already have one. Oh, hold on. Okay, hold on. Okay. If you want to do some flight planning on Thursday, okay? But what's your question? Uh, what do you want? So I was trying to do that the aircraft performance. Airplane yeah. performance one, and they had the uh, like density altitude kind of like flow chart where you call it from outside temperature all the way to. Does that okay. sound familiar? Yeah. The diagram. Oh, the performance chart. Yeah. I don't understand how to use it. Okay. So we went over it. It was kind of quick, I think. Yeah. We'll go over that. What I want you guys all to do is start making lists of things you have questions about, previous discussions, or things you found on the test so far. I'm going to post some more this weekend. Um, and just this the next couple of weeks, you're gonna be just get, I, get you guys ready for the written and any questions you have from what we've done in this class, okay? The things you're concerned about for your, when you start when you start flying, the things that you want to learn about, or the things that you have just in general questions you have in general, okay? We are done with the regular stuff that I had scheduled for us to discuss. So now it's just to finish off the semester and get you guys ready to go. All right, I wanted to make sure. What I really want from you guys for this class, for you guys out of this class, is to be able to walk into flight ops on your first day of flying and already have a good idea of what you're going to do and how to do the lane balance. Know what I'm safe and hey, checklists are. How to go out there pre flight, like what you're looking at when you look at the airplane, like what are the different components, like when we did the walk around the airplane out there, okay? So your pilot, your instructor doesn't have to explain all this stuff to you. You already know most of it. So when you get in that airplane, the taxing, you know what the rudder does. The rudder steers the airplane. You use those rudder pedals. The brakes are here. You know just everything about how the airplane operates. If you guys can get out there and do that, hit the ground running rather than have to spend your first couple hours learning stuff that we talked about here, it's going to help you out. Amen. You should be more prepared. Amen. So, the more information you have, the more knowledge you have, the cheaper and easier flight training is. And I'm all about cheap and easy. So. All right. So think about that. If you have any specifics, shoot me an email, okay? All right. So yes. Make sure you're all signed in. Yes. Okay. So I look up the Here, I'll, I'll write, I'll, if you want to write it down. Yeah. Why is that stopping?